about reductions. Great. Um, no need to clap. At least not yet. Yeah, if it goes all right, you can consider clapping at the end. Um, yeah, so it's uh, just wonderful to be here presenting at this workshop. Um, really enjoyed hearing people's uh, new work and ideas and, and things. Um, so I'm going to tell you about reductions, as Alex said, and uh, the primary aim of this talk is to maybe try to demystify a little bit um, of some of these ideas to take some of the magic out of the, these ideas if they've seemed sort of unapproachable. And um, maybe the reason for this is because there's a sort of folklore in uh, complexity theory that average case reductions in particular are really challenging. And so we learned this sort of from the beginning. And I remember taking complexity courses and being told like, all right, average case reductions, you don't want to go there. I mean, there's been this Levin stuff that's really nice, but we haven't made a whole lot of progress since then. And so um, the primary maybe aim of this talk is to convince you that we should be optimistic about this direction in general. Um, all right. Um, so uh, yeah, with that said, it'll be a little bit tutorial in nature. So feel free to interrupt with some quick question. I might've forgotten to explain some things, some notation, whatever. Um, don't hesitate to just ask. All right, so this is joint work with um, Matt Brennan. And as uh, many of you know, um, Matt suddenly passed away earlier this year, um, last year of his PhD. He was going to be a Miller Fellow here in Berkeley. He was gonna be here in the program. Um, he was, he was truly brilliant. He was extraordinarily generous, kind, and just full of joy. And uh, um, in light of that, it's um, especially nice to uh, tell you about some of his ideas and to revisit the countless hours of uh, discussion we had on these topics. All right, so the basic question that we're motivated by and that pretty much everybody in this whole semester program is motivated by is when can I and when can I not solve some statistical problem of interest? And the particular uh, reason that one might not be able to, that we're interested in, is because it's computationally challenging. We don't have enough computational resource. We have many, many problems, and we've heard about some of them, and we'll hear about many more. And even some of you have your own favorite problem that you're holding close to your heart that, that we don't know about. Um, and, and so we have all these different problems, and they uh, all seem to exhibit some curious and interesting phenomena, which we've seen a lot of and you're all familiar with, uh, which is that the complexity of recovering the signal can often be the um, determining factor relative to the statistical challenge. Not only that, but there's some very interesting interplay between the statistical challenge and the computational resource that we have. If you have more computation, you need less statistical resource and vice versa. So we wanna understand all this, um, but it's a bit overwhelming with so many problems. And so one might ask, well, what would it mean? What would it even mean to say that a set of problems each have a hard regime for the same reason? What would it mean to sort of clarify this picture to some degree? And complexity theory tells us, um, gives us the suggestion. Well, if we had some problem, some simple problem that explained fully, ideally, all of the computational statistical trade-offs and a variety of problems, this would be at least uh, partially satisfactory uh, progress on this question. It would, it would give us some insight. Okay, so that's sort of the aim. Um, we don't explain every problem under the sun, but that's kind of where, where we're trying to go in this direction. Now, um, what this figure indicates with these arrows is that this single problem at the, actually I have this cool pointer, this single problem indicates, oh, it's magic, right? Um, it's a new toy. Um, all right, so yeah, the single problem explains maybe what's going on in all these other problems. Um, but complexity theory tells us that we should be potentially dreaming much bigger, as has been done over the decades in complexity theory in a variety of arenas. Um, and so we might uh, aim for strong equivalences between problems, we might aim for completeness classes, and so forth. And um, if all goes well, and we all work very hard, then maybe we can add a complexity class to the 544 complexity classes. Uh, on the complexity zoo. Okay, so that's maybe some broader context, but for now we're a little bit less ambitious than this goal. All right, so we, we wanna do average case reductions as the title says, and we're gonna consider a particular notion of average case reduction. This is basically the notion that was advocated for by Lecam well, in the eighties. Um, and as I mentioned, and as you've seen in Luca Trevisan's bootcamp talk, there are other notions, especially Levin's that's proved very useful in other contexts. 
But for statistics problems, it's natural to look for a statistician, Lacan, especially I guess here in Berkeley. So, all right, so here's what the notion of reduction we consider is. We would like a polynomial time algorithm, A, and we would like to take as input an instance of either the null hypothesis, pure noise for some problem, or H1, which is noise plus signal. Of This is your sort of starting problem. And you'd like to map it to some other problem, P prime, where the algorithm A has no idea whether you're observing pure noise or signal plus noise. And in either case, it does the right thing. So in either case, it maps the pure noise to the pure noise under P prime. And it maps the signal plus noise to the signal plus noise under P prime. Now, why is this such a good thing? Well, if somebody, um, oh, I should have emphasized uh, the way in which this mapping is done is in uh, sort of the criterion for success is that it's mapping to negligible error and total variation. So what this means is that the output is indistinguishable from the true distribution that defines the target problem. Okay, and so this little of one here indicates that the total variation between the output of your map and the thing that you're trying to map to P prime is little of one in total variation. Okay. okay, so why is this good? Well, if somebody claims to have some algorithm that solves the target problem, then that's a delightful situation for you who wishes to solve the source problem because now if you're given some instance of the source problem, you don't know which one, well, you map to the target problem, the algorithm solves the target problem, and you've thereby solved the source problem. If the algorithm runs in polynomial time and the, the claimed, sorry, yeah, the algorithm runs in polynomial time and the reduction runs in polynomial time, then their composition is an algorithm for the source problem that runs in polynomial time. All right, now why total variation? The reason is that it transfers the type one plus type two error of this algorithm here to the new algorithm for the source problem. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so those are reductions. There, there have been a fair number of reductions um, of this flavor over the last decade, roughly. Um, apologies if I've missed your, your paper here. Please email me and let me know. I, I prefer not to miss people's papers, so I won't be I won't take it personally. Just, yeah, please email me if, if I forgot your paper. Um, but I want to highlight three papers in particular that were, you know, have been very influential on how we think about things. So the first one here is of uh, Philippe in the audience and uh, the student in Berkeley, um, Ma Wu and Hayek Wu Shu. Um, I guess the Shu here is Jia Ming. So we have lots of audience members. Maybe Yi Hong, the, the Wu here is somewhere on Zoom. So hi, Yi Hong, if you're there. Um, so, so anyway, I'll sort of describe how, how these uh, papers of influence are, are thinking. And the aim with uh, sort of everything here is to almost go from scratch fairly quickly, admittedly, but uh, none of the ideas should really seem like they come from nowhere. So um, hopefully I can give that context as, as we go. Um, but uh, the high level is that when it has some statistical problem, it has some phenomena. And the, the thing that I think really shocked everyone and why this really, this, this first paper of Philippe really got everybody excited is because, well, this, this thing isn't happening in isolation. You can understand what's happening in sparse PCA by looking at a totally different problem that's been well studied, plant and clique. And that's uh, a pretty deep insight. Okay, so there have been uh, also a great deal of works talking about restricted classes of algorithms. And um, again, this is a very incomplete list of papers. Uh, my apologies if I've forgotten your paper here and left it out. I, I mean, I know I've left out many, but if you want yours added again, email me. Um, but um, yeah, so, so uh, the, the point I wanna make is that the analysis of problems under restricted class of algorithms is complementary in nature to reductions. Um, and so uh, why is that? Well, if you do a reduction between some root problem here and a target problem, now, there is benefit to analyzing the root problem under restricted classes of algorithms. And um, if, you know, for instance, one shows hardness based on restricted classes of algorithms, let's say an SOS lower bound or low degree, concluding that the root problem is hard. Well, one concludes that the target problem is hard. And if there are reductions to many problems, one concludes that all of those are hard in the appropriate regimes, All right. So obviously um, you know, reductions kind of amplify the power of the restricted classes of algorithms approach. Yes, please. Yeah. Are you saying that the root problem is actually hard uh, for an unrestricted algorithm the target problem is hard? Or are you saying that for each one of those limited type of algorithms, the reduction shows that hardness for the limited type of algorithms is actually so hard for the limited type of algorithm? 
Um, so, so that's a good question. Um, the claim that I'm going to make here, it's, it's a little bit delicate because the reduction might not, for instance, be a low degree polynomial. Right. However, um, all of these are, are uh, all restricted class of algorithms are proxies for a certain amount of computational power. So low degree polynomial is a proxy for polynomial time algorithm. And so you would want to conclude that you know, if, if the you know, root problem is, is hard, these are all giving evidence for it not being solved in polynomial time, let's say, or requiring you know, two to the n time or whatever. Um, and so then one concludes that if the root problem can't be solved in poly time, then, then neither can these, right? But it doesn't mean, okay. So taking it from the answer is that it doesn't mean that these reductions are gonna imply that if I have hardness with respect to some restrictive class of uh, algorithm, this formally can say to hardness with respect to the same restrictive class of algorithms. That's right, so formally no. Um, so it would depend on the situation. Uh, but with that said, if you then produced a polytime algorithm here, so you think, thought about sort of the contradiction, that would then violate your, your restricted class of algorithms being, a, so if you had a polytime algorithm here, you would get a polytime algorithm for the root problem, and you would therefore conclude, for example, that the low degree prediction is wrong. Okay, so. Well, you can do polytime even though you can do low degree. That's right, that's right, okay. So hopefully that's clear. All right, so. Um, I'll just quickly sort of maybe elaborate a bit on this connection between uh, restricted classes and reductions. Um, so, you know, obviously reductions are future proof. The reduction is just there, it connects the problems. And if we have some new, better class of algorithms, then we can analyze the root problem uh, against those as well and include things for the target problems as we've just discussed. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, okay, this is maybe just sort of a restatement. Um, Good. So maybe, yeah, I won't dwell on this point, um, except for, uh, you know, it might be more subtle, to maybe I'll mention, aside from just polynomial time or not. Um, so for instance, uh, Tzulia and Alex's paper showing that uh, planet submatrix or planet dense subgraph is hard for recovery um, is really interesting because, well, it's interesting in its own right, but it's also has additional implications because uh, we have some reductions that are based on recovery being hard for the source problem. And so then one immediately concludes um, sort of even stronger statement about the target problems from their results. So they really do kind of go hand in hand and, and play well together. Okay, so reductions are, are what we're talking about and that's what we wanna do. Um, the sort of demoralizing thing about reductions uh, that, that we were faced with was that the vast majority of them relate problems that look like some submetric signal plus noise with planted clique and uh, you know, superficially these look kind of the same. And so uh, if you're sort of ambitious about doing reductions to a wide variety of problems, um, it's unclear uh, if this can be overcome in this challenge. Okay, so you know, we were extremely motivated to understand, can we map from planted clique to a variety of problems with very different structures than planted clique, very different from planted submatrix plus independent noise. So this is the diagram of reductions from uh, our paper from last year. And so there are a lot of problems here. Um, many of these problems are problems that various people in the audience have thought about a lot and have um, really achieved uh, a good amount of understanding. Um, an example of a problem here would be robust sparse linear regression. And I don't think anybody can claim that robust sparse linear regression sort of looks like planning clique. It, I mean, it looks like a completely different problem. And so um, sort of the surprise for us really was that it's even possible to relate so many problems to this basic kind of vanilla looking problem planning clique. Um, now, as we'll see, and this is maybe the thing I wanna convey from the technical side in this talk is that these relationships are surprisingly simple. They're really, you can think of them as all of these problems as being linearly related in some way. Linear meaning linear transformation. And so this is a really simple connection between problems. Um, now, before I get there, I'll say a few more words in a second. Um, there are these source problems. So one of them is, uh, let me go back here. One of them is um, a partite hypergraph planted clique. So this isn't actually exactly the normal planted clique that you're familiar with, it's a variant. Here are some other ones that are a little bit more similar to the standard planet clique. Here's bipartite planet clique. Here's a k-partite version of planet clique that I'll describe in a little bit. And you can combine these various uh, 
variants of planet clique. So K part bipartite planet clique. The main point is that K partite hypergraph planet clique is the strongest assumption. Assuming that that's hard is the strongest assumption and implies all of these others. And so there is just one source problem that um, underlies all of these problems. Um, another remark is that one can sort of unify these different versions of planet clique under a single version that's called secret leakage planet clique in our paper. And in a nutshell, and I'll describe it a bit, but in a nutshell, it just assumes a different prior over the clique position. So instead of being uniform, it's something else. Okay, so there's two key ideas that the, this is the, the aim to convey. Uh, one of them is if one squints at all these problems, squints uh, you know, fairly intensely, but, <laughs> but nevertheless, just, just squints at these problems, um, then these problems are related by a linear transformation. And uh, these transformations, I think you know, Matt really didn't, didn't want to make it seem trivial, and so he didn't want to say that they're linearly related, and so he, he came up with this nice name called Bernoulli rotations. Um, but when it comes down to it, um, it's, it's really after various massaging and squinting, one gets uh, that these are linearly related. And so that's the, the main technical thing I'm, I'm going to sort of explain in great detail, going step by step by step, building up from a very simple scenario up to various uh, of these reductions. Um, and then the second one is this thing I mentioned with the planted clique assumption actually not being so convenient. And a little bit of a variant makes a lot of these techniques work much more easily. Um, we don't know how to make them work with the vanilla planet clique, but a tiny change helps a lot. Yes, please. Yes. So maybe you'll get to this um, later, but if these were genuinely linear transformations, then it seems like uh, you could pass through low degree lower bounds, SOS lower bounds, and stuff through these reductions. So is there some, I don't know, does that seem... It seems very Plausible doable. Or... Absolutely, yeah. So, the, it was, yeah, it, it seems absolutely doable in my opinion. But it, again, these things have to be checked very carefully. So, so you'll check that the, these transformations involve a, a critical linear part and various other things that are um, are are here. And maybe this is this asterisk of of if one squints, um, one requires various techniques for uh, algorithmic change of measure, so when changing of distributions from say Bernoulli to Gaussian, but others. Bernoulli to Poisson, various other distributional changes, um, filling in missing entries and matrices, going from symmetric matrices or tensors to asymmetric ones, and all sorts of things of this nature, which one would have to do a little bit of thinking whether one can implement all of those as low degree. I suspect yes. Um, but for instance, with this change of measure thing, I mean, one would have to do some argument to argue that you, know, you can truncate some polynomial and it doesn't induce too much of a loss. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay, so I'm not going to talk at all, actually, about all of these uh, these gadgets and tricks. These are sort of probabilistic gadgets, very different in flavor from the sort of gadgets that people are used to in complexity theory. Um, but I'm not really going to talk about those. Um, and uh, the the reason is because um, they're sort of what makes this all look so fuzzy and murky. And I want to explain how it's actually a fairly clear picture of what's going on. But if you're interested, I'd love to talk with you about these, these tricks and things because they're important. Otherwise, nothing else you know, can actually be made to work. Okay, so here's the plan. Uh, we're gonna warm up by talking about Gaussianization of Bernoulli's, a uh, technique called Gaussian cloning, and then a sort of strengthening called reflection cloning. We'll talk then about Bernoulli rotations, which is this uh, linearly relating thing that I mentioned, which is actually a generalization of reflection cloning. So that's why it's going to be worth going through this whole sequence. And then we can apply to um, a bunch of problems of interest. We'll start with robust sparse mean estimation. We'll see tensor PCA, robust sparse linear regression, and also stochastic block models. I know many of you. Um, Maybe especially in the European side of things, are very interested in stochastic block models. So um, I might swap the order between uh, the sparse linear regression and stochastic block models. Okay, so uh, we start with our warm up. Um, here's planted clique. As you're all familiar with, we're going to be considering sort of hypothesis testing formulations for everything in this talk, I should have mentioned. Um, but uh, you know, most of what we say works for. Uh, transferring estimation problems as well, but, but yeah, hypothesis uh, testing. So uh, detect is there a clique or, or no clique of size k in the Erdős-Rényi random graph. Um, you're all familiar with the thresholds. For us, we care that 
there is no algorithm known that succeeds when the clique is smaller than root n. And there's considerable evidence for this via restricted classes of algorithms, including by many of the folks in this room. All right, so it's gonna be uh, convenient for us. I, I mentioned the secret leakage. So I'll just quickly mention the, the simplest uh, variant of secret leakage, uh, planning clique. And so secret leakage is just that you know something about its position, therefore its position is no longer uniform. Okay, and so here's the particular way we're gonna constrain the position of the clique. We're going to have a, uh, a partition into K parts. So here's each you know, part. There's N over K vertices in each partition. And we have the constraint that there is one clique vertex per partition. Okay, now if you think about this, you should ask yourself, I mean, is this a mild constraint or a severe constraint on the position of the clique? And you might convince yourself that it's fairly mild. And the reason is because, well, if you just choose K vertices at random, the vast majority of them will live on their own within one of these partitions. Okay, so it's a mild constraint. It doesn't reduce the entropy of the clique position very much. Okay, so this is the sort of constraint that is gonna be useful. And uh, well, the conjecture is that this is such a mild constraint that it doesn't change the threshold for hardness relative to ordinary planning clique. Okay. Um, as I said, you can generalize this to think about other priors over the clique position. And um, the natural thing to do is to analyze where does the threshold occur based on low degree polynomial prediction or statistical query. And one can arrive at a prediction that's for general distributions rho, which has to do with if you sample two independent clique positions according to rho, this is the prior. And then one looks at the probability mass function of the cardinality of their intersection. There's a condition on the rate of decay of that probability mass function. Okay, and this is unimportant for us um, in, in this talk, but the point is just that um, one can analyze this slightly more general starting assumption and you know, move on from that. Okay, so here's again, uh, Here's actually the warm up. I thought I thought I was going to do the warm up, but here's the warm up. Okay, so uh, for those of you who haven't seen this, uh, there's some really cute ideas here, and, uh, and uh, the initial ones are not are not our ideas. So um, this this problem is bi-clustering. Uh, as I mentioned, this is Zhang uh, Ma and Yihang Wu's uh, paper, and um, bi-clustering problem. Well, you have an n by n matrix, and here is planted an elevated mean. So there's a k by k submatrix with mean lambda, and the rest of it's in Gaussian noise. This is the phase diagram of this, the easy, hard, impossible uh, diagram. Um, and well, they show a reduction from plenty clique that explains this hard triangle. So I'll just very quickly explain this reduction. The uh, hard triangle looks like this. Um, let's first consider the bottom edge of this triangle. Okay, so if you look at the bottom edge of this triangle, um, Sort of, I mean, I should have explained what the, the axes are here, uh, assuming um, you, uh, you paid attention to Tzlil's talk yesterday. This might be especially confusing because you should have, you sort of saw this, but it looks different. And the reason is because the parameterization is a bit different. So here, lambda, the size of the mean is on the vertical axis. Um, so it scales like n to the minus beta. As we go up, the problem gets harder, the sigma gets weaker. Here on the x axis, we have k to the alpha. Sorry, k is n to the alpha. So alpha gets bigger. This, the planted signal gets bigger and the problem gets easier. You can see that in terms of how these regions are arranged. All right, so yeah, so we're gonna start with the bottom of this triangle. We start here. And you know, the first thing that you would uh, ask yourself when you look at such a diagram is, okay, what does this actually mean in terms of the, the bi-clustering problem? And so here, beta is zero, because we're on the x-axis. So we put essentially a constant size elevated mean. Uh, in terms of its magnitude. And then we have the size of this planted submatrix, and it's somewhere between, I guess, zero and square root of n. All right, if you look at this, you should think, well, this looks a lot like plenty of clique. And indeed it does. And um, the first uh, step of achieving this bottom of this triangle um, via reduction from plenty of clique is just to map the entries of on a click entry-wise to the appropriate Gaussian. Right, so how does this look like? Right, because obviously if you know you started with 
this is the plan and clique phase diagram, and we're just transferring over this little red strip to, to this triangle. Okay, so um, the first thing, if you're gonna have such a mapping, is you better map the clique, which is Bernoulli one, in other words, all ones, to the, the planet distribution, which is Gaussian with mean lambda. And so if we call this distribution P, that means one maps to a sample from P. Turns out that you want to map zero to a sample from 2Q minus P. Why is that? Well, let's check. What do we need to check? We need to check that Bernoulli half gets mapped correctly. And so Bernoulli half gets mapped to the half half mixture of 2Q minus P and P, which is Q. And so indeed, this will map all of these Bernoulli half entries out there into Q, which is standard Gaussian. So this accomplishes the change of measure from Bernoulli to Gaussian. Excellent. Now, some of you uh, astute listeners and the observers in the audience will see that maybe this isn't quite satisfactory because 2Q minus P isn't necessarily a valid density. That's true. And that's part of the technical work in Ma and Wu is they show that you can truncate this distribution and get something that is a valid density and it doesn't affect the output too much in total variation. Okay, so um, this paper has two nice ideas actually. The first one is this idea of changing Bernoulli to Gaussian. Obviously, just to reiterate, the reason why this is non-trivial is because you have no idea when you're observing an entry that's one or an entry that's Bernoulli half. And you, you need to apply a Markov kernel or randomized mapping to get an appropriate output that actually maps each of these to each of those, right? Okay, so this is this really nice idea. And uh, actually they have another really nice idea, which is um, that they show how to change the size of the planet structure while appropriately trading off with the signal strength. And that's in order to achieve the other triangle, uh, other edge of the triangle. And um, it's going to seem fairly simple in this context, but we'll quickly build up to a much more uh, general version of, of the same high level concept. Okay, so um, the idea is that we're starting down here, right? So constant, Lambda essentially, or you know, slightly uh, decaying lambda, and we want to move along this edge of the triangle. So we need to grow k because we're moving to the right, and we need to decrease the signal. But well, we can't decrease it too much. Obviously, if we were to move at the wrong angle, we'd just not be tight against the algorithms, which is where the screen region is. And this turns out to be this line is that lambda k squared over n is constant. Okay, so here's the uh, the sort of reduction that that Ma and Wu came up with. It's a simple idea and it turns out to work. So what they do is they start with two by two blocks. So it's four entries of the matrix and they average them. Okay. What does that do? Well, we end up with a matrix that's half the dimensions. So it's, you know, n goes to n over two. Now with high probability, you're only gonna get one of the planted entries in each of your two by two blocks. So K actually stays the same because you're not decreasing the size typically. So k stays the same here. What happened to lambda? Well, we need to retain the fact that the variance was one. So we're normalizing by two uh, because we're adding up four entries. And so lambda goes to lambda over two. We can check what this does to so scaling. So lambda k squared over n goes to lambda over two, k squared over n over two. So indeed it maintains that constant value and it's moving along this, this trajectory. This makes sense for everyone? Okay. Turns out that there's a completely different way of doing this. And this other way is what generalizes in a nice way. Okay, so we came up with this way of doing things in uh, this 2018 paper, um, but it's actually based on a very simple idea, um, which uh, statisticians might call Gaussian sample splitting or Gaussian cloning. Um, I think Philippe first told me about this a um, long time ago, and I was, I was very excited to learn about this uh, sort of almost trivial fact that's surprisingly useful. So here's the idea. You're given as a input to this little mini subroutine, a Gaussian with mean lambda. Okay, so lambda can be this planted lambda in the problem. You could also think of lambda as zero, it doesn't matter. The output is gonna be two independent copies of a Gaussian, still with variance one, but lambda has now decreased. I and mean, you have to pay something, right? If you're gonna have two instead of one, you can't get it for free. So the signal strength decreases a bit. So how does one do this? 
I mean, you already know how to do this. People don't know how to do this. So this, this is, a, I mean, this is actually a little bit surprising, that, you know, because you're sort of creating more of something. You're creating more signal somehow, even yeah. though the signal went down, right? So it's doing something interesting. Okay, so here's the the way to do this. So let Wait, the, the point is the map, but the mapping has to be deterministic. Is that are you no, or it's no. oblivious to lambda? Sorry, it's oblivious to lambda. It's oblivious to lambda. Okay, oblivious to lambda. Perfect. Yeah. Otherwise, I can just make some new samples. You know. Otherwise, you can do all sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Okay. Yeah. That's right. Okay. So so we're gonna sample a fresh standard Gaussian independently of x. And uh, sorry, this is a little small. We're gonna hit this. Uh, pair of Gaussians now with this orthogonal matrix. And uh, of course, by linearity of uh, sort of the Gaussian and linearity of applying a linear transformation, you have here the same matrix times the mean vector, and then the, the matrix times a pair of standard Gaussians. Now, this is, as I said, an orthogonal matrix. We know that isotropic Gaussians are orthogonally invariant. And so this remains isotropic Gaussian. We see what happens here on the mean vector. Well, with just the left column, it's lambda and you have the normalization one over root two. And so this is now the output and we're done. Okay, so this is just orthogonal invariance of the Gaussian distribution. Very simple. Um, now, there is something that's a, a bit conceptually funny here, which is that it's doing sort of the opposite of what Mawu did. Instead of shrinking things, it's like blowing things up, but it turns out to accomplish the, the same trade-off. And so we can see that quickly. So we take a single entry here. Um, we turn it into four. Lambda goes to lambda over two because we went from one to four instead of one to two, like on the prior slide. K goes from K to two K now because the planted thing got doubled in, in, in size. Um, and so we can just check what happens. We have lambda k squared over n. Here we have lambda over two, two k squared over two n. And uh, the, the k's, or sorry, the, the factors of two cancel and we have indeed moved along this axis of the triangle, along, along on this edge. Okay, excellent. So any, any questions on this by clustering? So this is Mon Wu's stuff. Uh, very nice um, idea. So, uh, you know, we might think beyond by clustering. Well, a natural problem, and it's already shown up today multiple times, is the uh, rank one submatrix. So we now have a rank one spike here, and it's still living in, in a Gaussian uh, matrix. You might ask, well, has anything changed? Are the thresholds different for this problem? Does the phase diagram look different? Okay, so here's the phase diagram of by clustering. Now, what's changed here, and this is an example of a rank one matrix, is obviously that some of the entries are negative. And uh, this uh, whole easy regime is obtained by adding up the entire matrix and comparing to a threshold. And so that trivial algorithm no longer works for rank one submatrix where some of the entries in the planted thing are negative. And indeed the, the uh, phase diagram changes to the, even for the detection problem, changes for the, to the recovery diagram for bi-clustering. But anyway, this is, this is now the, the diagram. And you know, this bottom edge of the triangle can be achieved in the same way. And we just need to figure out how to move from this point, which means constant lambda and root n size planted thing up, up and right. So how does one do that? Well, obviously we need to increase K and the signal shouldn't decrease as much because the slope went down. How can we increase K without losing as much signal? Well, let's think about what we did. Well, we did this cloning by drawing an independent Gaussian Z. So all this uh, exogenous noise and we're injecting it into the problem in order to transform things. If you pause and look at this for a bit, you would say, well, wait a minute, this, this whole matrix is full of Gaussians. Can't I just reuse some of these Gaussians? Like, why, don't, why do I need these Gaussians from out there in the world to, to degrade my signal? Let's we'll just reuse some of them. Okay, so that's, that's what we do. So um, here's this technique, it's called reflection cloning. We start with this uh, by clustering. So this is all positive. These are all lambdas as, as here in, on, on this bottom axis. Uh, we make two copies of the, of the entire matrix. Put the bottom copy and multiply by negative one, the, the entire matrix. And of course, Gaussian is uh, named Gaussian. It's, it's symmetric about the origin. Red here indicates that it's negative. And uh, 
you now rescale slightly by root two to keep the variance as one and you add them. And so up here we have the top minus the bottom over root two and on the bottom we have top plus bottom over root two for the, for the, the entire sort of rectangle. And if we just um, give these original pieces names, let's say X and Z, I should have put Z I think above, above X, then you'll see that it's actually just the same exact orthogonal transformation applied to now sub blocks of the matrix instead of taking this exogenous noise. Okay. Okay, so now you can repeat this horizontally and we now have these negative entries and positive entries. And it exactly looks now like a rank one submatrix, but it's not an instance of bi-clustering, which has everything positive. So this added freedom of having negative entries actually allowed us to do something different. Um, and you can check that, well, lambda went to lambda over two and k doubled and n stayed the same. And so um, it, it indeed moved us along the correct trajectory. Oops. Okay. Yes, so just yeah, please, yeah. Do you do this on the entire matrix? You split it into two? Is okay, this operation being done on the entire n by n matrix? That's right. Yes, exactly. So it's done simultaneously for sort of half of the, the entries relative to the other half at a time. Yeah. And then it's repeated, I should say. I mean, this, this only doubled things, right? So now if you actually want to move along this edge, you have to continue and you repeat this. Okay. Take the question in the audience here. Yeah. Thanks. Um... Let's see. I'd like to I'd like, I'd like to ask uh, if, if you do this, if it, it feels like the, uh, the the random entries of the, of the original matrix uh, might might might, uh, might not be mapped to uh, all random entries in the in the larger matrix. Is is there a danger there? Well, at each okay, so at each step, the uh, the entries remain independent and Gaussian. So you just argue that inductively. Now, what you can have is that you can have some of these things colliding. This is a little bit maybe. Uh, maybe slightly misleading to just, you know, talk about flipping along the, the middle here and having all the planted stuff at the bottom. So you can have some collisions and uh, indeed, if you have collisions, then um, your planted structure will no longer stay completely flat like this, but it will stay rank one. And so um, one is reducing not to a completely flat rank one submatrix, but to something that's almost flat, uh, but still rank one. The norm, the norm is preserved. Of, of the plant signal. Ah, I, I, actually, I, I, I see sense. I, I see now that the, the entire matrix as a whole is, is not getting larger. It's, it's, it's just that the, the, planted, the planted part is being, is being expanded. That's right. And actually, the, the way that you're saying that is actually really crucial. So I'll emphasize this. What's happening is that the planted signal is getting sort of smeared around. And it's getting smeared around in a very particular way. But this notion of sort of smearing around the planted signal while keeping this matrix roughly the same size is important. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this is all, you know, planet submatrix, and nevertheless, uh, looks a lot like sort of planet clique, except for not having these negative entries. And um, so the next, you know, segment, I want to say how to generalize this in a you know, significant way to get to all these other problems. Uh, but there's a question, yeah. Yeah, thanks. But are we also preserving the prior from which the planted, the, the rank one, uh, I mean, what, what, what's happening to that? Because that's just sort of getting doubled in size, but where one half is minus the other half. What do you mean by preserving the prior? I mean, because the, the, the there, support there's... of the prior is even completely different, right? Because now you've moved to something that's, I don't know, end of the two thirds size and has a different signal strength and has all these negative, negative entries as you point out. Right, another question, maybe this is not what you're asking, but another question is, can you invert this? So if now, uh, does the reduction actually given a, uh, an algorithm that solves rank one submatrix, can it go back and solve the original bi clustering uh, recovery problem? And uh, the answer to that is yes. I mean, all of these transformations are, you know, are very easily invertible. And so you can go back and figure out what was the original location of the planet submatrix, even though you've moved it all over the place. Okay, good. So yeah, so we wanna get to all these problems. We won't get to maybe all of them, but we'll get to several of them. Um, Okay, and the generalization of this reflection cloning is uh, this Bernoulli rotations thing. Okay, so if there's sort of a, you know, maybe one technical portion that 
is actually not uh, super hard or anything, but is, is maybe just kind of the something to, to think about in terms of how one might generalize this reflection cloning. Um, it's this slide. So here's uh, maybe it's this and the next, but um, here's an abstraction of what's going on in reflection cloning. Okay, so we're starting with as input a vector. The vector has all Bernoulli half entries, except for it has a single entry that's one. Okay, and this one is in the ith position, and we call the planted Bernoulli of i distribution just Bernoulli halves with a one in the ith position. Okay, now this vector could arise due to flattenings of matrices or tensors or whatever, but it's just easier to think about vectors. The output is going to be a Gaussian with identity covariance and mean vector that's something that you choose. So we have a collection of possible mean vectors. And uh, if the input distribution was the planet of Bernoulli of i, the ith position was one, then the mean vector that you get is a i. Okay. So this is up to the algorithm designer or the reduction designer is to choose these these uh, vectors A1 through AN or a design matrix A. Okay, so that's what we want. And formally, there's some total variation guarantees here and stuff on the outputs. Don't stress about those. There is one important thing though, which is this tau. Whoops, this tau here is allowing, making, essentially making sure that you don't cheat. Because what, what is happening, if you think about data processing inequalities, tell you that you apply some randomized mapping and you can't take two distributions at this distance and go further. This is essentially ensuring that that fact of reality is true. Um, so it's unavoidable. And uh, essentially the thing to observe is just that we're rescaling here by one over the maximum singular value of your design matrix, where your design matrix is formed by arranging together these columns. Okay, this makes sense because if you were to, for example, just rescale the A's to make them take things further and further apart, I mean, that, that'd be sort of cheating. And so you have to, to normalize. Okay. Um, of course, the key is choosing these matrices or these vectors AIs in a smart way in the applications. Okay, so uh, how does this uh, reduction work? So first we just Gaussianize each entry using the Mawu distributional map. You now have a Gaussian where the mean, if your input was planet Bernoulli with a one in the ith position, well, you now have a standard basis vector EI just a one in the ith position. Again, it's you slightly lost some signal. There's a tiny loss there, like square root of log n. That's what the C denotes. All right. Now, if you want the mean to be AI, then the obvious thing to do is just to hit this vector with the, with the matrix because it'll just pick out the, the AI column. Okay, nothing surprising there. The only annoyance is that this also messes up the covariance matrix of of our thing. It's no longer isotropic, so you have AA transpose living there. That's a little bit unfortunate. Um, turns out that this can be corrected, and the way to correct this is just to add in an additional Gaussian with the covariance chosen carefully in order to cancel out the covariance that, that's put here. This makes sense. So this is identity minus the, the thing that, that got formed when we, re, when we scaled by alpha, or sorry, by A. And, and this sort of explains maybe where the, this uh, rescaling lambda is coming about because you need this covariance matrix to be PSD. So lambda had better be big enough to, to suppress that so that that's PSD. Does this make sense to everybody? Right, we've Gaussianized the planet Bernoulli. So it was all Bernoulli halves and then there was a one, Gaussianized it, hit it with some matrix that we chose and then corrected the covariance matrix. That's it, so very simple. Okay. So we're gonna see a first application of this. And I, I know I don't have a ton of time. Um, I might go over just a few minutes because uh, yeah, yeah, I'd really like to show some of the cool applications, but, but I won't go too, too much over. Maybe just a couple of minutes. So yeah. Um, all right. So here's robust, uh, here's non-robust sparse mean estimation. The goal, estimate a k-sparse vector in D dimensions within some L2 error, ideally as small as possible from N samples that are all Gaussian with mean mu and isotropic uh, covariance. But sparse mean estimation, just estimate a sparse vector and Gaussian noise. 
it's a statistical limit and computational limit are both k log d over gamma squared. And there's a sort of very easy estimator of just thresholding the empirical mean that achieves this. However, we can consider a robust variant of this where epsilon fraction of the samples are potentially adversarially corrupted. This is a very classical problem. It's arguably sort of the simplest problem in, in robust uh, statistics. Um, and what happens if you allow this epsilon fraction to be corrupted is there suddenly is a different computational limit that's off by a factor of k from the statistical limit. Okay, so how does one achieve this? Well, there's a nice paper of Jerry Lee and, and uh, uh, a group at CMU that shows how to achieve this computational number uh, using uh, some kind of programming. I won't get into that. For us, the interesting question is, well, why is there this computational limit? Um, and so we're gonna consider a very specific instance of robust sparse mean estimation. So here, well, we're gonna, we're gonna sample the corruptions IID from some outlier distribution. And we're going to choose a particular outlier distribution. And this is the outlier distribution suggested by Dick Nicholas, Kane, and Stewart, and then analyzed under the statistical query model um, by these folks. And so um, sort of they, they understood what is the hard instance for robust sparse mean estimation. And so uh, we were inspired by them. And we thought, OK, we should probably use this as our, um, as our distribution to reduce two, because it evidently seems to be the hard one. All right, so what is this distribution? Well. The, the mu here, the sparse mean vector, it's just going to be flat, has value x on support s. The outlier distribution is going to be Gaussian, and its mean is also flat on support x, uh, on support s, but has value minus y. And y is chosen so that the overall mixture has zero mean. Here's a cartoon of the, of the data matrix. We have our d dimensions, we have our n data samples. An epsilon fraction of the samples are corrupted. And so an epsilon fraction of these columns will be red because those are the ones that correspond to, to Y. So the outlier ones. The rest of them on support S, which S is just the, these coordinates where there is a signal, those are blue and value X. Okay, so this is a cartoon of the data matrix. Um, one of the things I wanted to, to convey and, and uh, I think I'll convey it here and also in a couple of the examples because it'll be very quick to see is that looking at these sorts of cartoons can just uh, really tell you how one should should carry out these reductions. And so this is this cartoon. Um, we want to reduce from planet clique. So let's start with planet clique. Here in each block, there's going to be a single one because we're looking at the secret leakage, you know, KPAR type version of planet clique. The reduction is just, well, apply the Bernoulli rotations to each row in each of these blocks. And one now gets Gaussian of some mean, where this is the corresponding column of our design matrix. Right. So now we, we have a Gaussian there, and its mean is the column of our design matrix. And you do this everywhere, and one gets this matrix. And now we want to just compare it to our cartoon, and that'll inspire us in choosing the design matrix. It'll tell us, can we actually carry out the reduction? OK, so we just sort of pattern match there. We get this should be our, our, you know, this is how our column should look like of our design matrix. It should look like this. What does that mean? Well, it should have an epsilon fraction of y's, the outliers. It should have a one minus epsilon fraction of x. And well, it needs to be an approximate isometry. Um, and that's due to the signal degradation that happens in the Bernoulli rotations. We just lose uh, some big factor. Okay, now maybe I'll just make a, a quick kind of abstract remark, which is that. Um, this A being an approximate isometry, and this connects to Aaron's question, is you can think of these, uh, all these problems abstractly as there's some signal and it's in noise. And uh, what's happening here is we're just kind of mapping the signal and the noise, and we're preserving the LT norm of the signal. And, and so if you think about some class of spectral algorithms or something like this, and a problem where, where those algorithms are gonna be tight against the algorithmic threshold, these transformations are preserving the signal strength. Um, so that's, that's why this approximate isometry condition is entering. It's because otherwise you're just not going to map tight against the algorithms. Okay, so how in the world do you find such a matrix? Um, okay, so just to start, let's uh, imagine that epsilon is half. So now we need a, a matrix where each row has a, 
half of its entry is some value and half of its en entry is some other value. Um, and if we go back to our uh, reflection cloning, we, we see that um, actually maybe we, ha we have uh, an understanding of, of how to map to robust first mean estimation with epsilon as half. If you just repeated this over and over again, you'd completely fill in this. Of course, it's the transpose of, of the prior cartoon I drew, but you would see that you just have completely filled up the, this sort of strip and with half of its values one and half of its values minus one. And so it would exactly be mapping to robust first mean estimation. Okay. Um, now, probably everybody here recognizes this as a mention to Hadamard matrix. And um, kind of the correct way to think about this reflection cloning construction is actually is applying a Hadamard matrix and you can do it all in one shot. You don't need to do it iteratively like this. So um, here are some Hadamard matrices and uh, you can just kind of visually inspect it and convince yourself that roughly half of each row has value one and half has value minus one. Um, and we all know that Hadamard matrices are orthogonal. So it exactly satisfies this isometry condition. Okay, so Hadamard matrices solve a robust first mean estimation reduction specifically for epsilon as half. And so you might ask, okay, this is, this is good, but, but nobody's interested in robust estimation with half of the samples being disturbed by the adversary. And so what's going on? How does one generalize this? So this generalization is, uh, is uh, you know, quite elegant and, and uh, um, yeah, it's something I guess that Matt realized just one day kind of out of the blue. Um, and I, I can explain it very quickly is what's going on in this generalization. So um, here's a four by four Hadamard matrix. And uh, it turns out that you can understand these Hadamard matrices in terms of the incidence geometry between hyperplanes and points in an appropriate um, vector space over finite field of appropriate dimension. So what do I mean? Well, here we have F2 squared. So length two elements of F2. Here on the left, we have hyperplanes in F2 squared. And we're gonna fill in a matrix with certain values depending on whether the corresponding point is in the corresponding hyperplane. So one if it is and minus one if it isn't, if you do this, then you can just visually inspect that this is exactly the bottom three rows of this Hadamard matrix. And so this gives an alternative way of constructing Hadamard matrices based on this incidence geometry of finite field uh, vector spaces. Okay, good. So far, I haven't said anything about how to generalize beyond epsilon is half. Um, but it turns out that if one takes the cardinality of your field to be R, and one in general looks at FR to the T, this is going to be the, the column indices or the points, the R to the T points in this vector space. And on the left here, one considers the enumeration of hyperplanes plus all of their affine shifts. The affine shifts turn out to be critical for um, epsilon shrinking um, or for R growing. Um, and you fill in the entries one or one minus R, depending on the incidence. The point is in the hyper, hyperplane or it is not. Okay. so. Um, we can see various things immediately from here, namely that if you think about a given point, a given column, and we ask, well, how many of the affine hyperplanes is it in? Well, it's obviously in a fraction one over R because there are shifts of any given hyperplane and only one of them contains the point. So these are hyperplanes of co-dimension one. That's right. Okay. Yeah, so there's are hyperplanes of, of co-dimension one. Yeah, perfect question. Yeah, that's right. But in general, you could consider more complex constructions pairs of hyperplanes, put a mention bigger than one, et cetera. Okay, so if we just go back to our uh, desiderata, what did we want this matrix A to satisfy? Well, we wanted it to satisfy that it has a one minus epsilon fraction of the sum value and well, epsilon is gonna be one over R and like we saw in the prior slide, it exactly satisfies this proportion. It also turns out that um, this construction gives an approximate isometry. It's not exactly an isometry, but it's very close. And uh, it's pretty quick to check, just to do the combinatorics of, of, uh, of this geometry. Okay. Um, okay, so unfortunately I went a, quite a bit slower than I wanted. Um, I do wanna just show some, some pictures here. I guess there were a bunch of good questions, but yeah, I really wanna show a few of the pictures for these reductions because that gives this flavor of, okay, so you just choose this matrix in some smart way, maybe even exactly the one that, that I already described for robust first mean estimation. And we get reductions to various other problems 
just by the, the cartoons of what's going on. Um, and so one can immediately see uh, at least some of these reductions. Okay, so tensor PCI I won't dwell on, um, but maybe I'll just accept to say that um, the same reflection cloning idea based on Hanamard matrices maps to sort of the canonical generative model for, for tensor PCA where you have some rank one spike um, that's not at all sparse and has entries that are plus and minus one. Okay, but I won't say more about this. Um, okay, the nice picture for, uh, for those of us who care about stochastic block models is as follows. So I'm just gonna describe this one briefly and um, yeah, and then probably we'll, we'll stop. So, okay, so here's a K community stochastic block model. Let's take K as little of root N. So this is the, the cartoon of how that looks. There are these, this is the, the mean of the adjacency matrix. You, you know, you observe Bernoulli's of course. Now, of course, I, I said this at the beginning, but in, in you observe a symmetric uh, matrix and no diagonal and things like this. But as, as I said, there are tricks to allow you not to stress about this. So, so it's easier just to think about, I mean, we could think about a bipartite version, but, but the point is it doesn't matter. Okay, now the information theoretic limits here are given in terms of P and Q and K and N. And uh, similarly for the algorithmic threshold, and uh, you've all heard about the custom stigum threshold, which describes where algorithms fail to succeed. All right, so we wanna understand if we can map to something like this. Um, we don't know how to map to something like this, but we can map to something that looks uh, very similar in flavor. Okay, and so I'll describe what we're gonna map to. Imagine that you're trying to recover the first community amongst the K communities. Okay, so we have the first one. And then, you know, the rest, not too concerned about what's happening there. And we're just gonna imagine that all the edges are kind of spread around. So it's a sort of mean field view on the rest of the communities, given that you're trying to recover the first one. Okay, so this is just the average edge density in this, the bottom right of the adjacency matrix. Okay, so this has the same thresholds and in general for a detailed discussion on where these thresholds occur for a variety of different stochastic block models, uh, I refer you to Jim Ming. Um, is, is written a nice paper discussing kind of a broad class and where the thresholds occur. Um, so this is what we're gonna try to reduce to. Um, now, I won't bother with the reparameterization and so on. You'll have to believe me or we can talk about it later. Um, what I wanna show you is the reduction. So um, we start again with K part bipartite planet clique. Consider a single such partition here. So single block in this matrix. There's a single one. This is the outer product of some EI with EJ. I'll apply the same design matrix KRT that we got out of the construction with the incidence geometry between hyperplanes and points on both sides. What we get is the ith row and the, the jth row outer product. Pictorially, we know that there's a one over R fraction of value one minus R, roughly minus R and ones, so that's proportional to this outer product, which when you write it out, has R squared here, minus R, minus R, one. And if you remember, this is exactly how on the larger scale, our sort of imbalanced two community stochastic block model look like. So if you kind of plop this down in each of these blocks, then you genuinely get the, the stochastic block model that I claimed that we would reduce to. And so this is exactly the same design matrix as worked for robust first mean estimation. And it achieves the, you know, it goes up to the custom stigma threshold. All right, so uh, I'm, I'm uh, a fair bit over, over time. So I won't tell you about robust first mean estimation, uh, sorry, robust first linear regression, even though um, it's my favorite reduction from this paper. Um, it's, it's a bit unfortunate. Um, you know, uh, I mean, unless people really want, but then I'm just gonna screw up the whole schedule for the whole day. So I, I can't be responsible for that. So yeah, we're not doing this. Um, I, I will say that, that maybe the one, you know, 10 second thing to say about this is that uh, robust uh, sparse linear regression or mixtures of sparse linear regression is like very blatantly a uh, supervised learning problem. You're observing pairs X, Y, and uh, some of these other problems are unsupervised. And so one of the intriguing things here is this uh, tight link between unsupervised and supervised problems. I'm sure that, that on some levels, you know, this link has been observed before. I mentioned this to Adam Clivens and he goes, yeah, yeah, of course you condition on this thing and you get something. So 
um, I think people sort of know about this connection, but to make a, a tight computational connection between the two, um, I think is interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd love to chat with people about, about this reduction um, some other time. Um, and uh, there's many, many other reductions in this paper. Um, so I invite you to look at them and I'm happy, very happy to chat with people about them. Maybe just to conclude finally. So again, thanks for the, the 10 minutes over. Um, so maybe the high level is kind of twofold. One is that we have all these statistical problems and they have all these peculiarities, this distribution, that distribution, these funny planted structures. And the general aim is to try to understand them through simple combinatorial problems like planted cleave or variants of them. Um, and maybe the surprise is that all of these are related in what is actually a fairly simple way, just linearity um, applied to the structure. Um, okay, so this really is just a, you know, a, a, just something to, that should increase our optimism about this general direction. And there's a ridiculous amount of stuff to do in this, in this general direction and reductions um, and the surrounding stuff. And um, you know, very much hope people, uh, you know, people jump in into the fray. Um, so I'll, I'll end there. Thank you. Um, quick question about the um, the incidence geometry construction. I it's possible I just missed this, but like, is there perhaps like a randomized construction that's not so coding theoretic that would suffice? Yeah, great, great question. So. Um... There is a, a randomized construction. It, it works well for certain of the applications. And for other ones, it does not. Um, so in particular, there are tensor versions of this matrix construction where the randomized construct, the obvious randomized construction just doesn't work at all. Um, if you do still care about this matrix construction, the randomized construction is, in some of the applications, almost as good. But certain things it doesn't do quite right. So for instance, it will change the size of, it'll, it'll, sorry, it'll induce a random output size community, for instance, in the SBM. And here it maps to deterministically sized community. So if you care about those sorts of distinctions in the problem definition, does the algorithm have to be robust to not knowing the size of the community, things like this, then these, uh, based on combinatorial designs, are sort of more effective. Yeah, that's a great question. And there, there are some alternatives. I have a question, if I may, if it's a good time. Yeah. You, uh, I was wondering in the mapping for the stochastic buff model, did you need the number of communities to be of the order square root of n, or, or does that actually go through if you have very few communities, like five? It doesn't go through for any constant number of communities, um, but it, it's... Uh, the number of communities is little over root n. So it can be, I, I think you want to think of it in our reduction as any polynomial n to the alpha for alpha less than half and greater than zero. So n to the one over 100 is fine. In particular, so I don't know where this, where this is exactly, but r here, this is one over r. And so this is, r is the number of communities. And so we do need r to be growing a little bit, but it can grow slowly. So what is kind of the challenge for the constant R? Maybe this is, a, this is a great question. I think it's a generic challenge actually for all of these reductions. And so, you know, one of the maybe philosophical points that's worth making about these reductions is that all of them are between parameterized problems. So there are all these parameters like signal to noise ratio parameters, but also here, number of communities and things like this. And part of what makes these reductions possible is that they all lose just a little bit in the parameters. So typically it's like some log factor or square root of log or something. So it's not egregious, but sort of nothing is sharp up to constants, I would say. And so that's maybe the high level of why that's challenging. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great, okay, one more question here. Uh, I think in, your, in one of your earlier slides, you mentioned that uh, we'd like to go beyond the low rank signal, mid sum matrix signal plus the independent noise structure, while most of your examples still fall into that category. So what, do, what would you think would be a really nice solution, let's say, to other types of problems? Uh, 
Okay, good. Yeah. So, so I guess that's the yeah. That's, uh, the question is, well, all everything that you're doing is low rank plus plus uh, sparse sparse low rank plus noise or something. But um, I think it's kind of in the eye of the beholder. It, it, you make a good point. I mean, you know, especially in retrospect, you look at these and there are reductions, and you say, okay, well, you did reductions. These must not be that different. Um, yeah, I think there's validity to this. I think, it, you know, it's a uh, one can always look at the next thing that looks just a little bit more different than what we've been able to map to. I mean, I think personally, like robust sparse mean estimation doesn't look like sparse low rank plus noise or like tensor PCA. That thing's not even sparse anymore. And there's a statistical computational gap, you know? And so that's one of the intriguing things. I mean, there's no sparsity there, but it's a tensor. Um, yeah. Maybe what about like a uh, planted CSPs or something? I mean, this to me would be a glorious to, to connect that to some of this. I mean, I don't even know if it's possible. It's unclear. But that would be you know a good challenge for people. Does the sparse SLR stuff naturally generalize if you have like sparse GLM or the link? There's an all-linear link function, but within that you again have linear. Okay, good. So yeah, the question is uh, what about GLMs and general link functions? Um, yeah, I think it's one of the most promising open questions in this direction. We know how to map to some very weird not very weird, but just not the canonical version of sparse phase retrieval, for instance. Um, but for general GLMs, uh, yeah, we actually worked on it. We have some ideas, but um, it's, it's something I'm happy to discuss. Yeah. Great. Uh, so since we're a bit behind schedule, maybe we should take a break now. There's a lot of room later in the day. Great. So break until 11.10, which is about 25 minutes. Um, yeah, so let's thank Kai again. We will say bye bye. I don't know if they yeah, hear us. And disconnect. Thank you guys. Yeah. See you tomorrow. Yes, yeah, so this is. Uh...